a new series. And uh, it's called, I'm Different Now. I'm Different Now. God's word is powerful. And God's word is true. It's the truth. And the truth has the power to change and transform us in dramatic and spiritually significant ways. You see, part of the reason the word can be broadcast on the radio or the television or sent out in tracks and people don't see uh, change is because the word has power to those who receive it. And we want to be those that receive God's word. We want to open our ears, our spiritual ears. We want to receive God's word. And when you do that, it can change you. It can completely transform you. Truth is the key that unlocks every prison door in your life. Without truth, you're a helpless prisoner. Now, I'm going to direct your attention to John 8, 31 through 32. It says this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, you've probably heard that scripture many times. I remember as a child, I would walk everywhere because as a child, my parents wouldn't let me drive. So I'd walk down the streets and around the neighborhoods and in the alleys and in everybody's backyard, wherever I was. I'd just walk, and I'd look at stuff, and I'd notice every little detail. I'd notice every little blade of grass, every little weed, every little bee on every flower, and, and all the stuff that you just don't see if you're driving in a car. You know what I'm saying? I noticed all the details, every flower, every street corner, every ant on the ground. But then I grew up, and I began to drive. And I began to go from point A to point B. And for the most part, I missed everything between point A and point B. Every small detail between those points was missed. And that, unfortunately, is the way many people read their Bible. They go from point A to point B. I've got to read this chapter today and get through this chapter until I get to the end. And when I get to the end, I can check that off the list. And it's like, you know what? Every step of the way in that chapter, every word in that chapter, holds in it the power to change you. And we need to carefully, carefully look into God's Word. And we need to prayerfully, prayerfully look into God's Word and say, Lord, open it up to me. Show me the truth. Show me what you want me to learn today. And I've noticed now, I've been saved uh, over 50 years now, or let's see, 56, yeah, about 50 years. And I never cease to learn something when I read the Bible. I still continually find new things I've never seen before. And I'm thankful for that because, see, the Word is alive and it's powerful. And I love God's Word. And God's Word has been my strength through my whole life. When I couldn't feel the stuff that you'd want to feel, like you don't feel secure, you don't feel happy, you don't feel safe, I've had God's word as my anchor, and that anchor has kept me steady. Whenever the winds blew, whenever the ocean rose up, the word kept me anchored. Now, if you read the word just to get it over with, you're going to miss a lot of things, and that's unfortunate. Every time you walk the path, if you will take the time to carefully look, you're going to notice something new. And you go, yeah, 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 I I know. The truth makes you free. I I got it. I've heard that one before. But you need to slow down. You need to listen more carefully. And you may notice something new if you begin to do that. Let's look at the familiar verse that I read a little bit more closely. John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, the word know in this verse, you'll come to know the truth, is a Greek word that means come to know, to learn, and to realize. And the word truth in this verse means this, truth, but not merely truth as spoken, but truth as an idea, as a reality, as the moral uh, truth in the moral sphere, 
in the divine truth revealed to man by God. So we're not talking about just any truth, because there's some things called truth that really, in God's eyes, are not the truth, you know? There's some things we say, well, that's true, but it's not the truth, because God's truth is forever settled in heaven. And no matter what it looks like today, if you go, you know, well, God says he'd protect me, and today it looks like he's not protecting me, that's, that may seem true, but that's not the truth, because in the big picture, he's got you, and he's protecting you. And he watches over his word to perform it. And we have to be knowledgeable. We have to gain knowledge of the truth because knowledge of the truth makes you free. Lack of knowledge of the truth keeps you bound. And I say this sometimes when I'm in, in, uh, you know, teaching in other places. I say, how many people here, you know, we know the truth. The truth makes us free. How many people here are free today? And I say, raise your hands. And I see at least half the people raise their hands. And I say, you're not. And they, what are you talking about? I know Jesus. I know. You know Jesus. But here's the thing. Is, do you know the truth in every area of life? Are there some areas where you know the truth and you're free? In other areas, you're still bound because you don't fully understand. And that's our journey that we go through life, gaining more truth and more truth and becoming freer and freer. You see, you may have gotten the shackles off your wrist, but you still may have shackles on your on your ankles. And God wants us, as we gain knowledge and understanding of his truth, to get freer and freer and freer. So this life is a process of getting freer. It isn't just like you were bound and now you're free. No, you were bound and now you're less bound and less bound and less bound. You're freer and freer and freer. So Jesus, and this phrase, make free, is a Greek word, Eleutherio, which means to set free, release from bondage, to remove restrictions of sin, to be delivered by God into true spiritual liberty. So Jesus had a friend named Lazarus who died while Jesus was out of town. And when Jesus returned to town, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And when Lazarus was raised from the dead, his body, we're talking physically now, was transformed instantly, wasn't it? Okay. Lazarus' body had already been embalmed, had already been wrapped up in the grave clothes. It had already began to decompose and decay. It, the Bible says he stinketh. Okay. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he didn't simply cure him of the prior condition that killed him. Like maybe he had a heart attack. Maybe he had cancer. Maybe he had an aneurysm in his brain or whatever. But Jesus actually spoke the word over his body, and every cell of that body that was dead transformed into new living tissue. It was a complete transformation. The man had a complete from head to toe makeover. So John eleven thirty-eight 38 through 44. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha. Mar Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, but Lord, uh, by this time, there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was, un was, was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Now, this is just like what happened to us spiritually when we received Jesus in our hearts. We were dead, and now we were made alive. We who were dead were instantly brought to life. Everything within us, our spiritual DNA, was changed. It was made brand new. We were now new creations. The Bible says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So now that you've been born again, you receive Jesus in your heart, everything ought to be hunky-dory, right? Life should be sweet, and you shouldn't stink anymore, right? Okay? Yay, Jesus! But that isn't the end of the story. 
when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus was not jumping up and down saying, I'm alive, I'm alive. Actually, he was probably saying this. His face was wound about with grave clothes. He's probably saying, somebody get me out of this mummy costume, right? Now, Jesus raised him from the dead. That was the miracle part. But then Lazarus needed to be set free. Free from the outer wrappings of a dead man. Ephesians 4, 22 through, 30, through 32 says this. We're going to go through this. It's going to take a little bit. We'll make comment as we go. Ephesians 4, 22 through 32. You were taught with regard to your former way of life that you put off the old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. There was an old self, and that old self we have to put off. Because, you know, when you get saved, you become a new creation but I'll tell you something that doesn't change your memories, your thought patterns. Those need to be renewed. You've still got the same memories. Unfortunately, God doesn't erase your data bank the minute you get saved. You go, I, I've never sinned. It's awesome. No, you know where you came from. And you still have some of those bad thinking patterns, don't you? You still have the grave clothes around you from the old man, and they might stink even of death. So the 23rd verse, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. This is what we need to work on. You're going to have to change the way you think. And the old method, remember this, was not God's method. And the 24th verse, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This means adopting God's new way of thinking. 25th verse, therefore each of you must put off falsehood. That's the old way. And speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body, body of Christ. We must serve the Lord in spirit and truth, not in carnality, not in phoniness. So the things we put off are our grave clothes, the clothes that keep us from being free, the clothes that keep us bound. And if you continue to wear those clothes, if you don't change the way you see things, the way you think, the way you do things, then you're spiritually bound even though you're saved. Do you see that? And there's lots of people who are saved but still spiritually bound. 26th verse, in your anger do not sin. Do not let sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, the devil doesn't have the power to overpower a believer, but the devil can tempt you. And the devil can, can coax you. And the devil can cause you to Go back to your old ways by suggesting certain things that you, you embrace. And we've got to realize we're a new man, but that old devil's still there, and the old man's memories are still there, and the devil will work through those many times to keep you in the old man so that you won't put off the old man. You'll just keep him. And what does that mean? That means you've been saved, but you're still wrapped around and bound and you can barely move spiritually because you're spiritually bound because you haven't put off that old stuff. you got to put off the old stuff. 28th verse, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. 29th verse, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for the building up of others according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, oh Jesus... If believers would just attempt to do this one thing, it would change everything. What am I saying? Well, you may not steal anymore. That's an easy one to say, well, I stopped stealing. I stopped uh, cussing. I stopped lying. But this says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Well, then what do you let out? But only that which is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs. If we could only do that. But how much still comes out of our mouths? And if it's still coming out of your mouths the way it used to come out of your mouths, then in that area, you still are bound. And God says, I want you free. I want you free from the past. I want you free from the old man. I want you free from the body of death, sin. And we go, but it just comes up. Yes, it comes up. And the devil probably helps you to come up with it. And the devil suggests. That's why it says, give no place to the devil. Because the devil shouldn't have a place, but he can have a place if you make him a place, right? Our mouths, our mouths, they're a very dangerous thing, aren't they? 30th verse, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is always trying to lead you and guide you into all truth so that you can walk in complete freedom. But when we resist what the Holy Spirit is doing, we resist his guidance, we resist his leading, then we're unwilling students, and we're stubborn. And we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do that. When the Holy Spirit says, please stop saying those things, please stop doing those things, and we go, ah, maybe later, but, you know, they deserve this, and I'm going to say it. And it's like, please don't say it. You know, this tongue, it's like a fire. And it says it's set a fire of hell. It's a world of iniquity within us. It says that if a man could tame his tongue, he could tame anything else in the world. But the tongue is the hardest thing to tame. Now, it's interesting that the tongue is so hard to tame because, you see, it doesn't say you've tamed your thoughts, you tame your tongue. In other words, you might think it, but you don't have to say it. You know, my dad, my dad, my dad says a lot of things in his life that didn't need to be said. A lot of cruel talk. And nobody wanted to hang around my dad. He was bellowing and, you know, hollering all the time. But my dad is now 94. And my dad has lost most of his voice. And he can't holler anymore because he just doesn't have the capacity. So my dad says few words now. And you know what? He's in a place, he's in an ageist deal, one of those ageists where they care for you. And you know what? He's so much more liked because he doesn't say the stuff he'd like to say because he's not able to say it now. People think, oh, he's a nice guy, he's so nice, because he can't talk so much. If we would just put the brakes on our tongue, if we would just say those, well, then, okay, I just won't say a bad thing. Well, you know what? The next step beyond saying, not saying a bad thing is what this scripture says. It says, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but that which is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs. You go, oh, all these people got all these needs and they need to be built up. What about me? You know what? If you will build up others according to their needs and they will do the same, then everybody will be built up. But our mouths get us into a lot of trouble, don't they? So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. 31st verse, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Yeah, what he said. What would it be like if we said, oh, I just combed over that passage. I zoomed through it at 100 miles an hour. No, no I took each, each step, and I walked, looked at the, the, the path before me. I looked at each thing, and I looked at my life, and I compared and said, have I put aside these things? Have I began to do these things that the Lord says I should be doing? Have I embraced the truth in this area, or am I not willing? Am I grieving the Holy Spirit because I'm unwilling to change? You know, if you walk this path, you look at God's Word, and you embrace it. And then you do it. You're not just a hearer, but a doer. You know what? You get more free. You become freer. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You know, Christians who don't forgive don't get it. That is one of the scariest places to be for a Christian. You know, there's a scripture, and I didn't make it up. Jesus said it. He said, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, your Father, which is in heaven, will not forgive you your trespasses. You know, that's a scary thing. You know what? I forgive you all, whatever it was, okay? <laughs> whatever it was, I forgive you all. Truth has transforming power. And the first truth that we need to accept is that Christ died for our sins and that we need to receive him into our hearts by faith. But that's not where truth stops. That's where it starts. After the new birth comes growth, and development. I've met people who are too proud to receive the help that God provides them through others. No, I don't know. I, I can do it on my own. The help that would assist them in being set free in certain areas. And Jesus told those who were not bound, where in Lazarus's case, 
to help unwrap Lazarus. In other words, Jesus enlisted the help of other humans to help Lazarus to get more free. But we go, I know, it's just me and God, I've got it all. No, sometimes we need to yield to the help of others to help us to get free. Lazarus could have been proud and said, I'm a grown man, I can unwrap myself, I don't need anybody's help. It's just me and Jesus, that's all I need. But Jesus said, you guys help Lazarus out. Lazarus was now alive, but Lazarus was still not totally free. There's a trend today, which frankly is a great deception, and the author is the devil, because he's the author of all deception. There's a trend of churchless, pastorless Christians. It's a trend now. Christians who think they need no one's help because they have themselves and Jesus, and others will probably just get in their way. Is that God's plan? Can you imagine an infant saying to the parents, they just get born, I don't need your help, I'll raise myself. I've got this. So let's read God's plan that God constituted, not man, or God instituted, not man. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave. Did you see that? There's a gift, and Christ is the one who gave it. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He gave them. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until, well, how long do I need that help? How long do I need the training wheels? Until we all reach the unity of the faith. Are we there yet? And in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, are we there yet? Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, are we there yet? Then I guess we still need each other, don't we? And we still need teachers and pastors and prophets and apostles. We still need all those things. Why did Jesus himself give these to the church? To equip the people. Twelfth verse for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Thirteenth verse, until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Pride says, I don't need your help. I don't need anybody's help. And it's hard to make disciples out of people that are proud. It's hard to make disciples out of people that say, I don't need a teacher. Transformation is something we all need, every one of us. We've got to be honest with ourselves. Can anybody be honest here? I can be honest. I'm not perfect yet. I, yeah. Are you perfect yet? I still need to grow. Do you still need to grow? Are you fully matured in every area yet? Well, what if you don't feel the desire to be transformed? What if you think, I'm just fine the way I am. I've grown to this point. It's good. I'm three years old, and it's good. I'm going to stay at three. Well, we need to understand this. Complacency is a spiritual disorder. And if you have this disorder, you need to be cured. Complacency is not okay with God. If you're spiritually numb and complacent, then you need a cure of what ails you spiritually. A cure to what keeps you from growing spiritually, from changing, from overcoming sins and doubts and all those other things, from fears, from attitudes that keep most Christians from breaking through into the abundant life. You need, you need a cure for that. Now, I don't know about you, but let me uh, say that this is true about me, and I've said it before. I'm going to say it right now. I believe that we are all, everybody here today, are all spiritual underachievers. In other words, we know we could do more. We know we could press in a little bit harder. We know we could try a little bit more. Not saying that it's your effort that gets you into heaven. I'm just saying it is your effort that causes you to be a disciple, though. Disciple means you've disciplined yourself to do. You're a doer, not just a hearer, okay? We all have room for improvement, don't we? We still struggle with many things that we struggled with at the beginning, don't we? Even before we got saved. No matter where we're at, we all know that if we pushed ourselves just a little bit more, we could be a little bit better. But how do we do this? What is the answer to our dilemma where we're stuck? Well, the simplest answer to what the cure is to complacency, of course, is an easy one. Jesus. But Jesus is a cure to the sin problem. He's the cure for those that are lost and need salvation. He's a cure for the saved who still need deliverance. 
He's a cure for the spiritually complacent that need to be broken out of lethargy. But as I said before, that's the simple answer. So we have to go a little deeper than just saying Jesus. You may have the right medicine, but if you apply it incorrectly, it probably won't do you any good. So do you remember those little roll-on things that were called absorbing junior? They were for muscle liniment. You roll it on your muscles and you're supposed to feel better. Okay? So you roll it on your muscles and they're supposed to be able to feel better. So what if you just take the top off and you drink it? Will you feel better? You see, you have to apply it according to the instructions. Because if you drink it, it won't help you. Okay? So how do we apply this Jesus to what ails us to get the desired results? We've got to follow the instructions. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you no longer have problems. Christians can be spiritually dry, can't they? Christians can be weak, can't they? Christians can be bound by certain sins even, can't they? And not be experiencing victory, can't they? Christians can be depressed sometimes, can't they? They can be lonely. They can be bitter, unbelieving, insecure, fearful. Christians can battle with bitterness and unforgiveness, anger and lust. You name it, they can battle with it. And we know there's a problem, but what's the cure? Accepting Jesus is not where the transformation ends. That's just where it begins. Why do we still struggle with some of these things that we should have overcome years ago? You came in here today, one person, but you don't have to leave the same person. Many of us are waiting for our churches to have a revival. If our churches would just have a revival. Many are waiting for something to happen somewhere. And they're hoping that when it does happen, it'll be contagious and it'll somehow infect us. We're hoping that somebody will catch on fire, and if we get close enough, we'll probably get on fire too. But you don't need to wait for revival, because revival can start in you today. God is searching for people who are searching for him. We think that if we just try a little harder, do a little more of the Lord's work, discipline ourselves just a little more, then we're going to be the kind of Christian we should be. Now, I want to tell you this. A tadpole cannot change himself into a frog by his best efforts. A caterpillar cannot change itself into a butterfly by willpower. God is the only one that can change you, that can transform you into what he desires, but you do have a part in the process. Many of us realize there's something lacking in our lives, and we've tried for years to fill up the voids by various means to no avail. And I'll speak for myself, and you could speak for yourself, but I could be a better man than I am. I could still use some changing, some transforming. I'm not yet all that God wants me to be. The question you've got to ask yourself is this. Are you willing to change? Is this the cry of your heart? Is the cry of your heart, oh Lord, please help me to change? It doesn't matter where you are today. God has a change that he wants to perform in your life. A change that will be for you're good. A change will make you more spiritually fulfilled, stronger, holier, better in every aspect. But you have to really want to change. You might be asking yourself, am I talking about prayer? Maybe that's the thing that'll change everything. Well, we all know prayer changes things, but still the answer is a little deeper than that. There is a place in the Spirit. It's called the secret place of the Most High. And perhaps you've heard of it. It's like no other place. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. If you've not been there, then words aren't going to really be adequate to describe it. There's a place, and it's in the very presence of God, the manifest presence of God. A place that is not of this world. A place that is filled and saturated with God's love, peace, and joy that this world can't tap into. And Jesus is inviting you to come with him and find that place for yourself. Exodus 33 describes to us an encounter that Moses had with God on Mount Sinai. Moses was leading the people of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, which is a type or a figure of Christians being delivered out of the bondage of sin. And while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, he encountered the Spirit of God, which spoke to him. And Moses had a request of God. Moses said this, Lord, if I've found favor in your sight, let me see your glory with my own eyes. 
And this is what the Lord said, Exodus 33, 20 through 23. And he said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And the Lord did just as he said. He hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. He shielded him with his hand. He passed over him, and for a moment he removed his hand so that Moses could get a glimpse, just a glimpse, of the backside of the glory of God, just a glimpse. And you know what happened? Moses' countenance, his face was changed instantaneously by just a brief moment of seeing the backside of God. In a momentary encounter with God, the glory of God manifested upon him. And what a strange thing, but Moses' change was only temporary. I want to tell you that when you enter into the presence of God, you can experience change. And many of us have been there at some points in our Christian life. We've been in this place, I feel, oh my goodness, I've just entered into something that's different. I'm in the place, I'm in the secret place of the Most High, I'm right in the very presence of God. What a glorious place it is, but I want to tell you this that if you've only done it once, then the glory will wear off. You've got to visit it every day. So let me suggest, all who call, call themselves Christians, all of us, are looking toward a day when the resurrected Christ shall return in the clouds to receive the church. And I'm not talking figuratively, I'm talking about literally. He's coming back for a people who've had their sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And let me suggest something that will occur at that moment. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corrupt, corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? That change, that transformation physically will occur in a moment, and it will be permanent, and it will be a complete physical change. We will receive a brand new body. But for now, that hasn't happened yet. For now, we're just going to have to wait for that transformation. But for now, God is working on the inner man. The outer man has to wait, but the inner man does not have to wait. God is inviting us into his presence so that our inner man can be transformed. We don't need to wait for the inner man to be transformed. That can take place today. This is the journey that we want to take in the uh, next few weeks during this message, is how to get in that secret place, and experience the glory of God that transforms us, that changes us. It's like I've said before, you can try with all your willpower right now in here to, to concentrate and get a suntan, but really, it won't happen. You've got to go out into the sun, and it'll do the work. You want to be changed? We need to get into God's presence, and it will do the work. So that's the journey we're going to be taking together in the weeks ahead. So come with me. Let's be transformed together. Let's be far different than we used to be. Let's be brand new creations. And in the series, The Chosen, that you've, many of you watch on TV, Mary Magdalene said this, and this is where this title of this message comes from. She says, I was one way, but now I'm different. The thing that happened in between was him. And that's where the difference occurs is with being with him. So God bless you, and uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the invitation, Lord, to not stay bound, but to be set free. And we want to yield ourselves to you, Lord, to your Holy Spirit. We want to shake off these chains that we've had on us for so long, and we want to walk in liberty that Christ has paid for. And we want to be the people that you have called us to be, so, Lord, we invite you. Help us now on this journey of change, Lord. 
Help us now to begin to see things the way you see them. Help us to begin to be diligent in putting to practice the things that you teach through your word, Lord. Help us to be mindful of your presence every moment of every day, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing and what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Elizabeth, can I ask you before you exit, is the chili thing, are people, uh, can they go directly downstairs or do we need to wait a few minutes? All right. So, before you all go downstairs, we have a, the chili feed is downstairs and that's a fundraiser that Elizabeth's leading. And before you go downstairs, is there anyone here today who has not received Christ as your Savior? If you have not, we want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. If you've never asked him to come into your life and save you, just raise your hand, anybody. All right, God bless you. And you know what? Well, let's just do this. Father, we just thank you for the food we're about to receive. And we ask that you would bless it to be health and strength to our bodies and bless our fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.